invite you to stand together as we sing our first carol, O Come All Ye Faithful.
seated. In the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh and lived among us. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, this Christmas Eve candlelight service. A couple of uh, quick announcements as we continue in worship. One is that uh, uh, it will be a candlelight service. At the end of our service, uh, we will sing Silent Night, and we will do that by candlelight. So as the, the, the flame is brought out into the congregation, I would encourage you, we're going to pass the flame to one another. And a good uh, rule of thumb is... Once your candle is lit, keep it upright. Don't tip it over to light someone else's candle. Keep it upright. Let the unlit candle be the one that is uh, tipped towards yours. The other announcement is that we will also uh, celebrate Holy Communion tonight. And it is, uh, it is important that you understand that all are welcome at the Lord's table. This is not a table that is reserved for members of First United Methodist Church or even Methodists. This is a table that is open to all that seek to uh, live in union with Christ and one another. So please, uh, when it comes time to celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion, know that you are welcome and encouraged to come forward. We have gluten-free elements available. Uh, if that is what uh, you require, just let us know when you come and, uh, and that is what you will receive. But let's, uh, let's continue in our worship this morning, or this evening, uh, as we uh, celebrate the birth of Christ. Would you lead us in our opening prayer, Kathy? Let us pray. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, be born in our hearts this night. Shine your light into the darkness of our world that all the earth might know your glorious presence and that all people might find hope in your love and grace. In your glorious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we go on with confession this evening, uh, offering, offering to God those uh, confession of the church as well as our own individual confessions uh, silently. Would you join me in this prayer? When the shadows of sin and sorrow surround us, shine on us with the light of your comfort and your grace. When the despair of the world overwhelms us, lift us with your promise of hope. When we forget the good news of your presence, cry out with your message of love that we might hear and remember anew. Christ is born. Christ is with us. We are not alone. In your beloved name we pray. Amen. I invite you to a moment of personal silent confession. Hear the good news. We who once walked in darkness are now children and no darkness this light. Glory to God. Amen. Our reading today comes from Isaiah 52 verses 7 through 10. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your sentinels lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy, for in plain sight they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, your ru you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has barred 
his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand once again as you're able for our next carol, Joy to the World. remain standing for our gospel reading. It comes this evening from John's gospel, chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Every year, I hear, you know, somebody, at least somebody, say that they had trouble getting into the Christmas spirit this year. I've had those years, you know, just uh, uh, being a little bit, I don't know, grinchy or whatever. Might be because of all the, the materialism that surrounds Christmas. Jesus often seems to be scooched out to make room for the sparkly sequined stuff. We put snowflakes on coffee cups at Starbucks. We have 
spray snow in the windows of convenience stores and Black Friday deals and TV commercials with people walking outside on a frozen Christmas morning out to the, to the SUV that the husband or wife bought for the other with a big red bow on top? Are we ever going to be able to pause and put an end to Christian or to Christmas materialism? I'm afraid we can't. And here's why. Materialism is the heart of Christianity. Now hear me out. Materialism is the heart of Christianity. And I'm not talking about materialism as in buy, buy, buy. I've got to have the latest and greatest stuff that comes along. That's consumerism. I'm talking about materialism as in the God of the universe materialized in flesh and blood. An honest to goodness human being. What had previously been perceived as being without form. This God that they didn't quite know. Previously without form, that God took up residence among us. Took on our flesh. Assumed our carnal nature. Came into our world in order to be with us, ultimately to save us from ourselves. As Archbishop William Temple once said, Christianity is the most materialistic of all religions. And that is a good thing. If we take a moment to realize what he meant by materialistic. Christmas. Christmas is about the incarnation. The Word becoming flesh. I know one of the things that uh, many families like to do on, on Christmas Eve um, is to read about the birth of Jesus, especially from Luke's Gospel. And there's just something necessary, I think, about hearing uh, about the birth of Jesus, the, the human birth of this Savior born in difficult circumstances, and the, 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 the shepherds, uh, the announcement to the shepherds, and the praises by the angels singing. It's a familiar story. It's one in which we find comfort and joy. We try to relate to Mary and to Joseph and even the shepherds on that night in Bethlehem. Was it cold? Were they frightened? Were they excited? Matthew and Luke and, and Mark's Gospels, those are what we call the synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that means that's a, that there's a lot of the same stuff going on in each of those Gospels. Some of the same stories, same kind of order to those Gospels, and in many cases, just you're, you're, you're able to read from one story to the next, and it all follows the same kind of history. It tells the history of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke introduce us to Christ's humanity, His mercy. We get to know Jesus personally through those three synoptic Gospels. But John's Gospel, what we read from tonight, John's Gospel takes that personal relationship to the next level. We develop this intimate knowledge of God through John's theological treaties. We may not be able to in John's Gospel, identify the, with those same characters. John doesn't bring up those same characters uh, when we talk about the birth of Jesus and the incarnation. In that entire first chapter of John, he doesn't introduce us to Mary or Joseph or the shepherds, not even the angel Gabriel. None of those characters that help us relate to God are mentioned. Instead, John's Gospel brings a God to relate to us. The beginning of John's Gospel really isn't one we can relate to. It's difficult. Even reading through it, it's not, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a story that we can relate to. There aren't those characters that we em, uh, empa, uh, empathize with. John's Gospel is different 
And then it presents a picture of God who relates to us. John's gospel, again, is God relating to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If we keep in mind that the Word, John uses that word, Word. (laughs) I'm going to get lost in this. But John uses that word, Word, in Greek it's logos, and it's really a reference to Jesus. Not simply a word, but Word, logos, is Jesus. And that's where it gets kind of deep and kind of difficult to understand. John's gospel, again, it was, it was originally written in Greek. And at that time, that Greek word that means word, logos, means much more than word. It was really, logos was more of a concept that attempted to convey the mind of God or, or, or the reason of God. We say word because there's really not another, there's not an English word that adequately translates from the Greek logos. Now, when I first started working on this uh, sermon for tonight, I started working through that word, logos, logos, and going through and doing a lot of research and uh, going down these different roads and rabbit trails and and, and trying to get to the fullness of the interpretation of the word logos. And after I'd done a whole bunch of work and writing and spent a bunch of time on it, I I studied the Hebrew word that most closely uh, relates to logos and and all of that in Greek. And and when I sat back and started putting the sermon together and, and started reading through what I had written, I realized that nobody really wants a lesson on Greek and Hebrew etymology on Christmas Eve. If you do want to hear about that stuff, um, you're just as nerdy as me, and we can have coffee later, and we can talk about it, but, um, and I know a few of you are just as nerdy as me, uh, but we'll we talk about that later, but if we, if we get to the heart of what this comes down to, what's important to understand here is that John is making it clear that the logos or this Greek philosophical concept of God as an impersonal, lifeless, abstract force. That's what the Greeks understood in this term logos as God, uh, an impersonal, lifeless, abstract force in John's Gospel. That actually entered into humanity. No longer impersonal, no longer lifeless, no longer abstract, but here in the person of Jesus Christ, the Logos, the Word, is infinite and eternal, and joined us, joined us here on earth as one of us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. The Word became flesh and made His home among us. We have seen His glory, the glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Some friends from the church invited us, uh, Cindy and I, a few days ago to go join them at the Grand Ole Christmas Show. Uh, It's kind of a, maybe some of you were there, I know some of you were there. It's kind of a variety show uh, that came to the Welder Center uh, here in Victoria, the the Grand Ole Christmas Show, and um, I saw lots of Methodists there. I thought about taking up a collection, but uh, but decided not to. Um, The theme of the show was somewhat of a throwback to Christmas's past, a nostalgic walk down memory lane. It got me thinking about how time passes and the traditions we have. Christmas is is kind of this marker of the passage of time. I remember you know, Christmases as a kid, maybe you do too. I, I, I remember mostly, uh, uh, well, I just remember so much, but um, when I was younger, my sister and I, uh, my sister would always stay in my room. She was younger than me, and we'd uh, sneak out 
sometime in the middle of the night, go get the stockings, bring them back to, to my room, and we'd go through the stocking. I even have uh, my, my old stocking here. Santa's nose is, needs a little work, but, um, and there was always an apple in there, and I, it was always stretched out like that. But it would go back. But we, we would do that and then take them back and put them in the living room before my parents would wake up. And uh, Of course, we'd eat candy and stay awake and go wake them up about every 15 minutes or so starting at 4.30 a.m. And, and I just, I remember all of those things. Um, the different ornaments on our tree. Uh, and maybe you have those. I've, I've got some of those here that, that we've kept. I've got one of my... <laughs> my cousins that was on my tree growing up, and it's on my tree now. One that I showed the kids this morning in worship that Ethan made. It's almost like a cookie. Maybe it started as a cookie. I'm not going to eat it. It's several years old. One that uh, my wife has one of these two of her mother. When, uh, uh, after our, our mother's passed, we had some friends that made us uh, some ornaments, one with a picture of my mother, one with a picture of her mother, the attic youth. If, you're, uh, if you have youth, we've got attic youth going on. And now, of course, you knew I had to work this in because we've got ones from all the different uh, colleges and stuff. We got a new rice one this year. Um, go to the bowl game. Um, and I almost hesitate to bring this one. Uh, I've got a Duke one, of course, but almost hesitate to show this one because I'm not sure it's a and I'm not sure if whoop is appropriate during a... And some of you shaking your heads. I know all that. So anyway, but all of these things, they, they, they are milestones. You could just sit and look at that Christmas tree and see the different milestones in your life. Looking over the past year, looking over the past uh, lifetime, potentially even prior to when you were alive. I remember our first Christmas as grandparents talking to a cousin of mine about a week or so ago uh, about how Christmas is just a little bit different this year because although we're going to have all of our children together, I don't know, I wasn't sure if we were going to have all of them under the same roof at the same time. And my cousin said, you know what? He's older than I am. He said, just enjoy what you get and cherish it. And I do cherish it. I know I can get a little annoyed this time of year when things don't go exactly according to plan, but I still love Christmas. I still love the idea of Christ coming to us, of God coming to us, knowing that, that we couldn't go to God. God came to us. Ethan came home uh, a few days ago since he wasn't going to be able to be with us uh, for Christmas. He came up to the church and he said, you know, Dad, it's, uh, it's kind of weird knowing that I won't be here with the rest of the family on Christmas Eve. Things change. So much good stuff has happened over the course of the last year. Also, some tough stuff. Sad stuff. Hard stuff. I've spent sleepless nights worried, sad, anxious. I've also had nights where I couldn't sleep because I couldn't believe my good fortune. Hard to sleep when you're overcome with grief or worry or joy and excitement. Whether it's looking back at the previous year or an entire lifetime. There's good and there's hard. And I think that's one of the reasons that I love Christmas so much is the the natural inclination to look back. So many things that bring satisfaction and things that are, that are also heartbreaking. Also looking ahead to, to new memories, new accomplishments. All those dated Christmas ornaments and so forth. Ones that my mom made, ones that diff- mark different milestones and everything. Those come out of the boxes each year. Reminding us that life moves quickly. That we are mortal beings. It's a reminder that I am mortal. That I'm finite. That I'm limited in my capabilities. I'm about as human as it gets. I, uh, 
I'm made of flesh. Flesh that sometimes seems to be falling apart. Expanding and contracting. And then expanding again. I used to proudly tell my wife that I could do the work of four men. Now I've come to the realization that I can do the work of about six lazy teenagers. (laughs) I'm kidding. I, I know that not all teenagers are lazy. But I know I can't jump as high as I used to. I have to take more breaks and rest sooner than I used to. For the last three or four summers, I, I, I vowed to get back on the lake and water ski. And each summer, I have not even attempted to get, get in a boat. By the way, if you have a boat, I've got a ski. Um, boat probably needs to have a whole lot of horsepower. I'm not a small fella. I'm just saying maybe this summer is the one. Even if it is, even if I do ski, maybe if I don't, I'll probably need lots of Advil, and I'm guessing that I'm not going to be able to be as agile on the water as I used to be when I was 24. That's just the truth. I'm not getting any any younger. Our bodies have expiration dates. We've all going to have to come to that realization at some point because we've been dealing with this question from the beginning of time. This this question of humanity. uh, Religious uh, folks and philosophers have been wrestling with this idea for ages about our physical self and our spiritual being, contemplating that, trying to find ways in which we can rise above our lower physical nature, detach from the physical world and connect with the spiritual world. You see that kind of thinking in the contemporary, I'm spiritual but not religious mindset. See though, that's just us trying to be like God. We want to have one foot in the world and one foot in the spiritual. The physical self separated from the spiritual self. We want to rise above the carnal, material, physical flesh and enter into a more spiritual realm. We think that's the answer. That's the key. Early philosophers talked about us being enslaved by the physical world. And the goal was to be free of the physical. That sort of thinking can be found in in, in exercises like yoga and Buddhism and transcendental meditation. But Jesus changes that mindset. That's not the way of Christ. Jesus came and brought the spiritual into the physical. Jesus, God of the universe, took upon himself our flesh, our physical nature, all things heavenly and spiritual and eternal, touched the earth in Jesus Christ. More often than not, on Christmas Eve, I've preached about those familiar events surrounding the birth of Jesus, the manger, the, the, the no room at the inn, the angels and the shepherds tending their flock, and all those things that are important. And they real, reveal so much about our Savior, Jesus Christ. But tonight, we focus more on the why rather than the how. John's Gospel calls it His glory. The Word became flesh and made His home among us. We have seen His glory. A couple thousand years ago, humankind was wrestling with what to do about our flesh. Just like today, they were concerned with what needed to be done about our earthly flesh, our decaying, domineering materiality. And then one night in Bethlehem, God slipped in among us. God assumed the very flesh that we find so restricting. God was born among us in the person of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, God in the flesh, and lived among us. And that's not what anyone expected. When we think of God, we don't think of someone who's joints pop and crack when they get out of bed in the morning. When we think of God, we don't often think of flesh. We think of God, we think of the spiritual, we think of the one that isn't tied to the material. But if we were honest, 
about our thoughts of God, and if we looked truly at who God is, the manger says no. God is more than spiritual. God is material. God is flesh. Bethlehem says no. God is material. God is flesh. The Word made flesh says no. God made His dwelling among us. Flesh and blood. We are finite creatures, human beings. We don't have wings and halos. We're limited. We're unable to reach up to heaven. Unable to rise up to God. Therefore, God has come down to us. This is Christmas. This is a time in the Christian year in which we celebrate the birth, the incarnation, literally the enfleshment of God in Jesus Christ. God became a person. A person with a name. A person with a face and expressions and friends and followers. Some might talk about meeting God when they die. Christmas reminds us that dying isn't necessary to meet God. God is in the flesh. God has not rejected the materialism of the body. God doesn't say, come back and see me when you are an evolved spirit. No. I get it, though. Sometimes we struggle with allowing our carnal bodies to encounter God. We come to church to get close to God, to get more spiritual. But the church, in its wisdom, says, here, have some bread, drink some wine, taste the material, get materialistic, because God has become flesh. God came to us not to deliver us from our flesh and all that flesh demands, but to redeem us in our flesh. To strengthen us in our frail and faulty existence by His mighty presence. I want you to recognize something this Christmas. We don't need to shed our skin or reject our humanity in order to rise up to God because God descends to meet us. He meets us where we are, but He doesn't leave us where we are. He makes our flesh a sacrament. We talk about His flesh as a sacrament in the Eucharist, but as God has come to us, the Word made flesh, He makes our flesh a sacrament, a means of grace, you and me, a means of grace, a physical, a, a, a visible sign of His inward grace and spiritual power materialized in each of you. Go spread the good news of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Amen. Would you join us in the affirmation of faith? It's printed in your bulletin. It comes from the Nicene Creed, which is one of the oldest uh, creeds uh, that we know. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, one of being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. And uh, as you prepare your offering uh, this evening, our, uh, our ushers will come through uh, to receive that offering um, and take time to be in prayer because that is also one of the ways in which we make an offering is not only uh, through what we give but also to what we offer through our joys and our concerns. So I invite you to that time of prayer as well. invite you to join me in our prayer of the great thanksgiving find it in the hymnal at page 13 I believe it is the Lord be with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord of God and light, earth and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, God. 
are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, thanks be to God. I would invite those that are assisting in serving Holy Communion to come forward, and as they come forward, I would also uh, invite and encourage you to stand and greet each other with uh, signs of Merry Christmas this evening. Body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take it now. We'll take that one. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Please come, and, and uh, as you come forward, you may stand or kneel at the altar rail to be served. Thank you. 
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us, in which you have come to us, God made flesh. Flesh revealed to us in so many ways, including the bread and the wine. Lord, may we go forth in the strength of your Holy Spirit to give ourselves for others. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And as we uh, prepare to sing our, uh, our final carol, Silent Night, Holy Night, by candlelight, I would remind you once more, that we, uh, so we'll, we'll come through lighting uh, from the back and also from the front. Kathy and I will come from the front. Our ushers will come from the back and uh, pass the light. As you pass the light down to one another as we sing, once yours is lit, remember, keep it, uh, keep it vertical. I invite you to, uh, to stand and sing Silent Night.
Christ the Savior is born. Go forth this night and every night and each day, knowing that our God comes to us, and as our God comes to us, may we go into the world carrying his light always. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Merry Christmas.